Hey, welcome back to Vice Grip Garage and part two of the 1970 Evinrude Skeeter Snow Machine. This was supposed to be just a quick, let's fire it up and tootle it around. And that's fully escalated to an expensive $74 budget build here. And we're coming along, we're getting there. Today I'm gonna finish putting this thing all back together. We've got the skis off it now. I gotta find the seat somewhere, tank, fuel lines. And then we're fully testing this thing. There's no snow, but that's what they make dish soap for. No, that's wrong. I refound the tank that I lost and found previously, so I second found the tank. Anyway, in between part one and part two, a guy is kind of really taking a liking to this machine. It's got like a 50s locomotive look, and I'm just, I'm digging on it. So I had to paint these skis up. I snipped them off. That's easy to do. Just a single little bolt and them plop right down. So I've been just sanding on them. Show you what I got over here. Thought this was gonna be fairly easy, but of course it's not. I've been digging on it with this thing. I got the cheek poker. I had the retina ruiner in here. I got the hand going. I even threw it in the blast cabinet and I've thrown more sand at this thing than an Indiana Jones fist fight. And it's not coming around very good. So I'm gonna to have to stop here and just call it good enough. You can see this is kind of cabinet work. This is all die grinder stuff, but this is just fine. I had some bare metal showing. I just wanted that, you know, hide it a little bit and then protect on it. Bottoms, they're a little bit pitted, but it's savable. I mean, we can live with that. The wear rods, I mean, these must have been on the thing. Might even be the original units. There's just nothing left. I mean, they're paper thin. So if you know where to find the wear rods that'll fit this here ski, put a part number down there in the bleep bloops for me, would you? That would be nice. So now that I've got track sighted, I think I gotta get these painted and drying before I do anything else. I'm still waiting on some clippy doodabby thingamajiggers for the fuel lines. Them should be shooting in the mail here and then we can snip them on. Bentley's gonna kinda fine sand on this one that's done, we'll call it, sure with some 400 grit, and then I'm just gonna really dig into the other one. And then hopefully with our powers combined, we can just, you know, paint them up a little bit. Turns out I'm out of 400 grit. So we're up to the 600 and that'll do nothing. Just keep on going, bud, looks great. So I'm gonna throw the other one up here and just start digging in. I actually snapped these off. Wish I wouldn't have done that, but what's a guy supposed to do? couple hours of work but I think we got most of the paint just snipped right off them. Of course if you're going to take her all the way to the touchdowns you just pull these pins out and 
probably blast the whole things and then powder coat them. Of course, we're just gonna tss, tss. We'll probably go outside and paint since it's extremely windy and dusty. That seems fine. And might just hang them off the old loader bucket. Guy's got them hanging in the paint booth out here, you know. This is fine. Those are the chains off my welding cart, of course. Guy's gonna hit them with some high build primer from Duplicolor, and that'll hide a lot of the fine scratches and imperfections in here. And then it's got an anti-rust property in it as well. So the surface rust stuff, that'll protect all that. And then I got some orange, of course. We're gonna just bring these right back around. I got one light coat on here. And I'm really impressed with this stuff. I only used a very, very small amount and I covered it all in just a fraction of a can. And I covered all of the sanding scratches on the top and even some of the heavy pits on the bottom that plugged them in as well. And that's this stuff right here, a filler primer refinish series. There's a ton left, be more than enough to do the other one here. I'll get this one knocked out. Maybe I'll scoot the paint booth forward here in the sun will dry a little bit better we're having an issue with dust storms today though so i only want them a little bit dirty Ironically, the Chevrolet red, orange, orange red. Anyway, it's DE1607, was the closest to the original color I could find. Well, it's the next day, you know. And as luck would go on and have it, I got 19 feet of snow. I just heard the GT500 quit. I had that running, because the guy was gonna just scoop out here a little bit while I could. But why did this quit now? Maybe I forgot to turn the fuel on. Probably not. No, nope, that's on. Is it out of fuel? Yeah. Figures. But anywho, guy's got some territory to test on that Skeeter if I can get her fired up today. So that's the goal, is just to thrash on this thing. Get her out here and just test on it. I got heated seats too. Sure ain't pretty, but... It'll get a lady's going town rig to town, you know. GT500, she just, it won't give up. Good old rig. We're going to pretend that this is everything we need. And we're not missing anything. These skis cooked overnight. I think they're ready. Yep. I did just mist on some clear jacket. Shiny stuff makes me nervous, and these are pretty dang shiny. I just wanted some more defense on them for when I jam them through some bushes and tree rows. I got some new fuel line, quarter inch and whatever smaller than quarter inch. These are those clampolators I was talking about. Handy, a lot better than the twisty type. Picked up the correct fuel filter, but then I found these on Evil Bay and they got a nice 90 in them and they came in a whole box of 700, however many fit in there. So I snagged them up. Probably use this because we're tight in there, you know. Got a new pickup screen. This is to a Kubota tractor or something, that'll work. And then a primer, just in case. If I don't use it on this machine, this is actually to an Arctic cat. Because I think my other sled needs one, so we'll have that. I'm going to start with just snipping these skis on quick so we can get her back on the ground. And then i got to figure out where all these pipes and stuff go. Get the tank on here. we got to get a new pickup tube in it. And I'm going to use... Probably this stuff here, she's anti-ethanol, you know. And the pickup tubes that came in these machines, I think until 71 or 72, ethanol gas would just melt them. It'd take them right down. So be careful, you want to use non-ethanol gas. Well, you want to use that in everything, your lawnmower, snow thrower 300s, your go get -ems and everything. But just so you know, if someone's running ethanol fuel and a machine you pick up, you're going to want to check that pickup tube because chances are she's just melted down. There was no way I was going to find another one of these. 
So I took her home and ran her through the dishwasher when Jessica wasn't looking, and she looks brand new. Dishwasher, not so much. But that goes on there somewhere. I went shopping again last night for where? Moses sandals! And I just couldn't find anything that was a direct fit. Maybe I'm missing it. But anyway, if you guys know wear rods that'll fit on these skis, again, please put that part number down there. That would sure help me out. I like how these guys rolled back then. No sort of castle nut or cotter key or nothing. They just throw a bolt on this and eh, it's just a ski. It'll be fine. about you fellers but I think that looks sharper than acute appendicitis. Pretty darn good for a couple bucks in spray paint. All right let's throw this fuel tank up here. Oh I already forgot. See? I need to pull this out and let's get that pickup tube later in there first. This is just a vent. Couldn't find one of these so we'll just do a delete. That's fine. Once we get this on, then we'll mount her up on the snow machine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Meltage. Okay, well, let's just throw a new one on here. Ooh. I think I'll run this to the cheek poker real quick. Mazel, it's right here. This seems excessive. It's fine. I like these old Arctic Cat ones because they got the spring on the bottom, see? So when it drops into the tank, that eliminates the socket sucked to the bottom there and you lose some fuel. Also, some of these have a 90 on them. So what you do, I don't know where my fitting went, here it is. Make a mark on this with a paint marker, clock that at six o'clock, which is down, you know. So when you tighten this, you want to make sure you end up at 6 o'clock down so your elbow is doing that and not, you know, the opposite. Just going to drop this in until I hear something and then snip it it off. Okay. Shh. Where did my light go? Does this work? Of course not. I just can't have nothing nice. This is an expensive flashlight. Where am I at? Where are you? Mm-hmm. I see you down there. Right about there is what it's telling me. Do you think that'll stay in place? I don't see why not. should do. You just want them snug. What have we got in here now? That looks good. That's a, that's a. Well, this is just kind of MacGyvered in here right now until we get everything done. Then I'll come back and you know Arnold Schwarzenegger these in. What I'm attempting to do here is do fuel in blue and then vent and vacuum and such in whatever butterscotchy yellowish color this is. That way a guy could just quickly hook his peepers in and understand what's going on, if in it ain't me. So we've got fuel in, fuel out. So I think we'll make a loop into here. And then this runs across over to this size, but I have two different port sizes. So I'm gonna have to, I think I got a reducer. I'll snip in there. And then I thought this might come in handy because we could do fuel in like that and then fuel out right up into that instead of trying to jam in an inline back here like they had before to make it like that. And then with it out here a little bit more, feller can just pop his hood and get his eyeballs right inside of that and see what's going on. Well, once you know it, today is 
actually Veterans Day. So I want to take a minute to thank all the men and women that have served, past, present, and future. Y'all are awesome. And just a reminder to you folks, you don't have to wait until Veterans Day to say thank you. If you know someone or you see someone in public, just do your best to always say thank you. I'm sure they'd appreciate that. Wow, this is just getting, it's stubborn. Quite the right size, but you know, when you gotta force them on there, sometimes you don't even need to run a clamp. Saving money, like that maybe. And then just a little piece right here. It's not gonna take a lot. Something like this. Whoa, whoa, easy, easy. Sometimes a guy can take one of those little finger burner 200s and just heat them up and they'll slide right on like licorice, but you gotta be a little careful because you can get pinholes that way too. And that causes fires. Ask me how I know. Nope, don't do that. Well, are we making progress? Here's what I've cooked up so far. And I think this will work pretty good. And actually how this is gonna sit, that sediment, if we get some, hopefully just hang out down on the bottom there. I'm gonna run the line fuel inlet now from here. And then there's a hole right there where I think the factory blew right through there and then right into that. And then the last one we'll do is just from here underneath over into there. And I'll probably put that coupler somewhere down under there so when it leaks, we'll never find it. Well, we probably can. This is gonna get hit with so much starter fluid. We'd figure it out. What is this now? Ouch. Yeah, I might have to heat this up. Get it over this guy. Oh, maybe not. I don't think a clamp later. The ones I got are gonna fit. We'll find out. Come on now. I just don't think it's gonna go. Do I have an automotive one? Probably not. <laughs> well, by golly, I did. Well, that's even too big. I just, well, at least we're going to get to cut corners. There. That took entirely way too long. Bring this through here and snip it up. Snip. Like that. And then it'll be brought down into there. See. Well, these are about worthless. Should almost have a little mini post filter in here somewhere, but we'll just let her eat. And I can tighten that little doodabby down in a minute. Then this little dude, he'll go back here like that. Brap, brap. I think I got her dialed in here where we need her. Probably not, but I mean, it looks pretty official, to be honest. A lot better than it did. Don't know if it'll work. Anyway, I'm gonna draw your attention down to here. There used to be what I call a cotter pin. Some arguably call it a split pin. Some also call it a nail, the folks that I get along with. But anywho, if you've got the young lady riding the sled or the kids, consider using a hairpin like that. And the reason for that is they don't get curled up in here and they can bind up. They're one of two reasons throttles stick on these sleds. One is those pins, of course, and the other is just my thumb. Just, you know, giving her the bar. Brappa! Brappa! For some reason, this is some unknown measurement known to man, and this doesn't fit on here quite the way I'd like it. 
And the same with this little do dibby fitting thingy I got off a of e-bizzle. And that brings her from this size to this other size. I don't have a clamp that'll fit this, but I mean, she's it pressure fit. So if I have a fuel delivery problem, it's going to be here or probably most likely there. But at least I know where to look. I'm not even going to put the air filtration system and HEPA filter in yet until we get fuel, you know, doing the thing on this whole unit. So I think at this point, I'm just going to finish bolting in the tank and let's drop some fuel on this thing and see if we can get her primed up. And I'm ready to see this thing run off its own tank in many, many years. I have the wrong size socket. Wow, what in the... These bolts are the same size as Chevy small and big block valve covers. So, you know they're gonna work. Click, click, 16 foot pounds. When this here majestic machine was created in 1969, October, the engineers did go on ahead and suggest a fuel ratio of 24 parts to one, oil to fuel. Unfortunately, gasoline is just, it's not good anymore. It's like a McDonald's hamburger patty. What happened to it? It's just, it's not there. But on the other side, oil has gotten significantly better. So I'm gonna start this machine off with a 40 to one, see what happens. And forget your computers and the plug it in scanner devices and the AFRs, this and that, computer blip blop machines. All the guy needs to tune an engine is his ear bone, his whiffer, and then just feel it. And it'll tell you everything you need to know. So I'm going to fire it up with 40 to 1, run her around, warm it up a little bit. And then we'll make adjustments if need be, because it's going to tell me everything I need to know. And 40 to 1 is right about there. <laughs> Nailed it every time. You know, I was a little bit surprised. Not really. I mean, a little bit. Part one there, there was a lot of fellers commenting. They've never even seen a snow machine, let alone red one. So I'm gonna give you some real life factual advice. Number one, always mix your fuel mixture in a different pan or tank than the actual fuel tank. Otherwise the oil and fuel, you know, they're not really mixing. And secondly, these only run when they're just wide open. There's no in-between. Well, that took 17 months. I'm about to get to know this snow machine a whole lot better. These work a lot better if you primalate them a little bit. You can take an air hose, block off a little bit, and, and that'll force some fuel up into the fuel bag it happener. But I just like to use the old Whistler. Anything happened? Nothing. Perfect. Guy's been blowing on this thing for about three years, getting a little woozy, but look at this. We got a little fuel in here. So that means the pickup tube is primed. So now, as long as we have adequate vacuum and pressure, which I'm sure we do, this thing pulls really hard, so there's a lot of compression. It should be able to suck this in and we should get fuel, I mean, honestly, within one to two seconds and this thing should fire right off. The metal is, I mean, it's cool, but it's not cold. We're in a 65 degree shop. Quick thank you to all the members for making that happen. Appreciate you guys a ton. So I think we're gonna try it without even the warm-up control on, just to neutral us out. The competition release out. We're not racing yet, don't need that. And we'll just pull on this thing and see if we can get it to fire off. I think I've got everything ready to rock. Guy's got the heat running, 
at an exhaust fan in the paint room slash grinding cutting room slash metal debris room slash engine room. That exhaust fan is running. Just in case it starts, we can get all the fumes out of here. Okay, ignition on. Yep, yep, yep. Give her a squirt. Almost. I can see fuel pumping. I think it's going to go. A little bit of throttle. Choke. Just a little bit. run but it runs like a north wind this thing sounds great honestly it's got a real nice crisp pop to it sounds really healthy this opposed two-cylinder has a really unique sound and I've been around 397 different types of sleds I'm telling you that right now I'm really excited the neutral lockout got stuck but I have a feeling if we disengage it and start it right now which I'm gonna do I'm sure that'll engage. I'm not sure why that's sticking. There's probably a grease circ on there. I'll look in a minute. But basically once it has centrifugal motion, it's sticking in the neutral position. It's not wanting to slide back out once that pin's depressed. So I'll take a look at that. That's a really neat feature and I want to be able to use that to warm it up. It's also got a warm up stand on the rear, which is really neat. We can kick that down. I'm going to do that now. Uh, engage the primary and secondary sheaves, get the track rolling, and then we'll see how that track is tracking and make some adjustments if we have to, go through the gearbox and brakes, 
And then I think we're ready to just, you know, we're gonna do the thing. So I disengaged the pulley and you can see the spring came out and I can't move it with my hand, but I'm sure this is gonna be fine now. And we'll engage the secondary sheave. This is that stand I was talking about. This is pretty cool. So this flips down and if I lift this up, now we have a warm up stand so you can actually run the track. So you can warm everything up a little bit and then when you're ready, you just hit, kick the stand out and away you go. So let's do that. Let's fire it up, make sure everything engages and get this track spinning for the first time in I believe 15 years. And then we'll be able to look back here and see if we need to make any adjustments. I did see some chunking if you remember from episode one on this side of the track over here and that kind of gives me a feeling that it's coming over this way a little bit too much it might be grabbing something and ripping up that track a little bit and how we do that is just pull this side back and get that track to come back over or we release this side to let it come over as well when we had this cut open i noticed there was quite a bit of flop in it and you shouldn't really measure track resistance unless it's on the ground but i have a feeling this side's going to need to be tightened to bring it back there's it never really makes sense to loosen a track to get in it to get it straight basically so let's let's fire this thing back up and get this track spinning might be kind of hard to see but you can watch the sheaves here when this one's spinning it's moving the chain and that means the track's moving let's see if it fires right back up can't breathe so clutch is working springs are working back here these are fairly warm actually which is fine uh, everything seems to be working okay the brakes there's nothing we got to adjust on this for the kiddos quite a bit of vibration i haven't looked under the track yet i'm going to do that again pull the flap up and i have a feeling that it's skirting like this and that's causing a lot of vibration there's also a lot of bog you probably noticed when I was holding this at a steady throttle, we were getting a lot of up and downsies. Basically your fuel mixture jet is probably gonna need to be adjusted. And basically all how you do that is you just put it on the stand like it is. You run it wide open for about five seconds. And if it bogs, you come in here and make an adjustment and you keep doing it. But you have to be really careful not to lean it out too much to blow this thing up. You can't go less than seven eighths of a turn out on this or it's too lean. When I refurbed this Craigslist rebuilt, I believe it's at two and a quarter turns, which seems a little bit aggressive on the rich side. Um, so I'm gonna lean it up a little bit and see if that helps. I did see a lot of air purging through here. I think we've got it fairly bled now. So that shouldn't be an issue. Um, smoking quite a bit, we might be a touch heavy on the oil so i may end up bringing her up to about a 50 to one because i'm running an ams oil synthetic um, some of the machines actually run an 80 to one or even 100 to one with that synthetic stuff but all in all i mean she's alive it runs it started okay ish ish what i'm going to do off camera for a minute is i'm just going to let it sit here and idle for about 10 minutes you want this puppy just smoking hot and i mean 
set a can of raviolis on it and cook it hot before you make any adjustments here because when you're on the trail that's a real life temperature you don't want to fire it up get it lukewarm make an adjustment hit the trail that's going to act differently so i'll do that and then we'll come back and see if we can make a couple adjustments to this we've got all sorts of track parts flying out that's fine just ignore those no idea what they are we just keep going We got a problem. Guy can't scoot this down to the bar after supper with no windscreen when it's 10 below. Got a fix for that. We're just gonna make our own. Of course, it's blue. Found this. I think this is what was supposed to be a windshield at some point. Goes on here like that. Yeah, we're not gonna have one 75 feet tall. What I did with this is I just used it to kind of trace a pattern for the bottom onto a sheet and then a guy just hooked his elbow in and just pivoted with the old marker here and I came up with this close enough got to do a little bit of trimming down here and then we'll line her up pop some holes in it I think I do got to run down to the Hardmore store There's supposed to be some rubber bushings in here and they're all gone Oh, no, this, this one there, I guess. So I'll take that down to the Hardmore store, see if we can get some rubber. Might even get a piece of aluminum go on the front there. Things are getting out of hand. Well, let's be honest, it's a full-blown just restoration at this point. Did the best I could. Guys, I'm in a hurry. You guys are just, you're getting, you know, impatient. And then I feel like I got pressures on me. So I'm going as quick as I can here. I got some Mitsubishi bumper bolts. That'll hold this on. And then I picked this up. This is a roll of that door guard trim. Protect you in the Walmart parking lot, you know. 12 bucks. And what I'm going to do is just run this around the edge here, put some shine on it, and that will prevent it from cracking a bunch as well. And also bring down the sharpness. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm cutting myself basically. I'm going to heat up the edges a little bit. Not a ton. You just want them where they're sticky. and bring this in here. And then just squeeze it and cool it down. And that'll make sure that the corners don't pop off when you get the sled up to 27 miles an hour, you know. Do the same on this end. Oh, come on now. There you go, one custom made windshield. Dennis Kirk, who's that?
Don't know about you fellers, but I think that looks pretty dang good. I like the lower height, gives her a little sport to her. Of course, a blue ties everything in together. Had the kids and the young lady sit on it and they can barely see above the bar. So that's about the perfect height for them. Gives them a little tint as well. I need one more of these Mitsubishi or Nissans or whatever they are to go into there. They only came in packs of two and I grabbed the two of the head. But that's good enough for now. I'm gonna move on, put a little bit of shine on this thing. And you don't need to do this in three steps with cutting and buffing and polishing and wax and just get the cheapest junk you can find at the parts store, put it on a foam pad, whirl it down and you're good. I promise you. I'm going to shine on the tank after we do the white fiberglass. I don't want to do the blue first because then we're going to smear blue everywhere. And then I got a surprise for you with the seat. Pop that thing on. Then we got to go ride. Because the sun is, she's about to set. And I don't know if we've got headlightage. This is a wizard cut pad, which is worth more than this whole project. Don't do that. Just get something cheap at Harbor Freight. And then you probably thought I was joking on the juice here, but I'm more serious than a bad throw up bearing. I just picked this up at Harbor Freight too. Mirror glaze. I didn't read the whole thing, but the first line is a deep gloss. Sold. We're going to put that on. Someone on the hotlines wanted some jazz music, so I think we're going to go ahead and fire that up on Vice Trip Garage Radio. You can sit back, relax, and enjoy, and I'm going to bring some shine around. Well, I would say that that probably worked just fine. Probably a dollar fifty-eight in shine juice there. I'm gonna move on and fix this brake situation here for the kiddos. You probably don't realize this, but these are actually 12-inch Brembo brakes on here. I mean, they grip. Really easy to adjust. Like I said previously, someone just kept trying to take up the slack here on the cable adjustment. That's wrong. So I'm gonna run this back down quick. There's a little castle nut in here. All you need to do is pull the pin out, run that in until you feel some friction on the secondary sheave here. Tighten it up and you're good to go. Tons of slack in here. I don't know that this has ever been adjusted to be honest. Okay, that feels pretty good. Run this pin back in. So this here is actually your chain drive that comes off your secondary sheath. And this is actually what hooks into the drive cogs for the track. On the E2000s and E2005s, this is actually an exposed chain. But on the 1500s, they cover it up here. You just gotta loosen these two bolts. And then there's this wheel here. And we gotta try to turn this, put some tension forward. And now make sure that the slack on the top of the chain is taken up. And then we can adjust this by rolling the dial counterclockwise. And that's really tight. So that's gonna be three of two things. It's either been really well maintenanced or it's low miles. These don't have odometers on them. Based on all the notes in the user manual, I'm gonna say that this has probably just been really maintenance which is a great thing. Lock this down so it doesn't back off on us. There we go. Did come back in here, put the air filter in here. And then I don't know how many of you caught it. I'm hoping you commented, keep a guy on his toes, but came in and put the primer line in. Whoops, just took that one off. I have to come back, plug that back in. And then when these sit around, they get dried out and they don't 
work right, you could prime them by just putting some sort of carb cleaner or a little bit of gas in there, and then these will start working for you pretty easy. So I think we're officially done under the hood. Maybe, I hope so. I can't be running around with these hand grips on. This is a full custom job now at this point. So I got something in mind, got this snipped off. That's a grip remover 9000. I'll show you how that works. Just like that, that come right off of there. Don't use WD-40 or anything like that putting your new grips on. They're just going to keep twirling. Use hot soapy water. That soap will dry and get super sticky and those grips won't move on you. I'm just going to throw these on quick and show you what I got. Wrong size, cut them to fit, but I think you get the idea. The ergonomics is there. Time for the seat. Look at this beautiful piece of equipment. I just can't believe it. But you know what? Jessica and I really started liking on this thing. And after all these years, I think it deserves a seat. That looks out of place, but excellent. I've got maybe 9 minutes, 32 seconds of daylight left. That's enough. Time to take this thing for a rip, see what it's got. but I'm not worried about that. First time she's been for a rip in 15 years, did just fine. This is gonna be plenty of sled for the wife or the kids. Probably tops out 
35 maybe, if that. Track works great. I don't hear any weird noises underneath the thing. We're just going to say she's good to go. If you guys want to see more vintage sled stuff, let me know. This is kind of a guy's wheelhouse, so I can get some Yamahoos and Arctic Kitties and maybe some Skidoos. You never know. Thanks guys. Appreciate it very much. We'll see you next time.